The content of this podcast is for informational purposes only. Statements made by hosts or guests reflect their own beliefs and opinions and is not investment advice. The hosts or guests may have personal investments in any assets being discussed. Hey everyone, welcome to the pod this week. I'll start by introducing our host. Starting with Bill, Bill is the driving force behind Daybreak Digital, a New York based VC firm known for its early investments in Avalanche, Google Pool, and Movement Labs. In the fast paced world of venture, they say the early bird catches the worm, and Daybreak is always ahead of the curve. Hey Bill, how are you? I'm great. <laughs> I'm going to put that on the website. That's great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, so moving on, um, uh, introducing Rhett. Rhett's one of the rare folks who uh, moved from AI to DeFi. Uh, Rhett, or as we call him, young Elon, uh, <laughs> is the double founder of Gravita and soon to launch a bot. <laughs> Let's think about something a little bit more humble, like um, I'm the, uh, I don't know, I can't even think of it. Okay, next. Introducing Jared. Jared's been mining blocks uh, since two years after Hal Finney then ran a validator group and uh, now plays a key role at Google Poll, the premier liquid staking token. Hey, Jared, how are you? Great. Bill's like checking out. He's like, I want out of this project. No, no, <laughs> why? Dude, no, this is great. I just, I, I just saw you go mic off as I'm saying insane things. <laughs> I'm JF. I'm the head of DeFi at Google Poll and an advisor to Avant. So um, this week we wanted to start with rate cuts. So the last rate cut by the Federal Reserve was in March of 2022. And this week we got a 50 basis point cut after more than four years. So let's start chatting about that. Um, curious, Bill, did this actually move the market? Do you think it will move the market? What is your thinking on this rate cut? Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yesterday was a big deal. They cut by 50 basis points. The market was expecting 25 or 50. So they delivered a little bit on the, you know, uh, more dovish side. It didn't really move the market massively. I mean, stocks are doing well today, but not a massive improvement. Bitcoin's also doing okay. Today. So risk assets are fine. It, it is a big deal because it is, you know, the last time they cut was March of 2020 in response to COVID. And they had this huge, very aggressive rate hike, rate hike cycle, which uh, they paused at the, in the middle of last year. And so now this is maybe the first in a series of cuts by the Federal Reserve. So uh, beginning of potentially a new rate cutting cycle. The, the thing that I was looking at for whether or not markets really were expecting this is for next year, how many, you know, how many rate cuts was the market expecting before the meeting? It was about 135 bips for next year. And after the meeting, after the announcement and Jay Powell's uh, press conference, we're pricing in only 125 basis points of cut for next year. So actually like... At marginally, I felt like the meeting was uh, a bit hawkish. So the market said, okay, they're not going to be as aggressive cutting rates next year. I mean, if you listen to the press conference, you know, Powell repeatedly stressed that the labor market is very strong. You know, the Fed would obviously like a soft landing. A soft landing is basically when they're able to achieve this nice trade-off between having tamed inflation, but doing so without causing a huge disruption in the employment market. So, you know, it wasn't, wasn't a huge deal in terms of what market expectations were yet, but I think the big question is, you know, what's, what's actually happening with the economy right now? Like, are we in a recession or not? And, you know, it's a very difficult thing to predict. You know, Jay Powell and the people at the Fed think employment is doing great, but I think right now we have to keep a very uh, close eye on what happens with unemployment. If unemployment starts to really tick up fast, then they will have to cut rates aggressively. And I was just think, thinking about this and by the way, I can go on for this for a long time. So if you guys want to interject at any time, please, please interrupt me. But, you know, there's in, in my career, I've seen you know the two previous rate hike and cutting cycles kind of are echoing this one quite a bit. Like the last you know, right before the global financial crisis, you know, they had raised rates steadily for a while, not as fast as this time, but they had raised rates steadily for a while. And it was roughly the same. It was like four and a half, maybe four and three quarters percent or something like that. And then all of a sudden in the financial markets, you saw some wobbles like there's a fund called Bear Stearns Asset Management that just went, just disappeared out of nowhere. And then in the spring of 20 or the spring of 2008 is when Bear Stearns essentially went bankrupt and, and was bought by JP Morgan. And like all these little crazy things started to happen in the financial market before Lehman went under and the Fed cut rates to zero. So something kind of similar happened in the last rate hike in cutting cycle. You know, the Fed very gradually raised interest rates. And they kept him there for a little while. And then there was some, you know, esoteric things happening in the repo market. And they started cutting rates slowly. I think they cut rates three times before COVID. And then COVID happened and they cut rates to zero. 
So I'm, I'm kind of feeling the echoes of the past two hiking and cutting cycles. You know, they raise rates very aggressively this time. You hear in um, interest rates all the time that monetary policy works with the lag. You know, it's only been a year since they really aggressively raised high, raised rates. And, you know, to see the effects of that on the, on the economy usually takes a little while. Um, so I would not be surprised if we started to see really increases in layoffs and unemployment go up. And if something like that happens, they will have to cut rates aggressively again. But again, like to try to predict what's going to happen with the economy is very difficult. There's many professionals out there who spend their whole careers trying to do it. And there's no evidence that there's any predictive power in these estimates. So, I mean, from a crypto centric point of view, it would be great if they could kind of without aggressively cutting interest rates, you know, achieve a soft landing. Risk assets continue to do well. Bitcoin continues to do well. It drags all the alts up with it. That would be great. You know, so I think that would be a win for us. But if we do see a recession and unemployment kind of tick up and rates go to zero because of some other type of emergency, it's not going to be like the previous ones. But all the markets are going to tank, like including crypto. Everything is going to tank. But then if they're going to have interest rates at zero again for a while, I think the bounce back in crypto is going to be insane. So, you know, for me, I'm just bullish in either case. Either we achieve a soft landing and, and you know, risk assets do well and therefore Bitcoin and everything else does well. Or we're going to have some sort of a crisis. And if we have a crisis, you have to make sure that you can stomach the crisis and stay in the market without selling. And then after that, I think things can get really insane, just like they did in 2021. Yeah. So that's kind of how I feel. One difference between this and some previous cycles is there's kind of fear of an inflation uh, rebound. Do you think that there's much risk of that? We have an unprecedented amount of uh, money printing happening, right? And it's difficult to predict where that money is going to go, right? So like when they, so in response to 9-11, they kept interest rates at zero for a long time and it basically pumped the housing market, subprime mortgages, right? After that crisis, they locked down subprime mortgages and they lowered interest rates to zero and then that money couldn't go into subprime mortgages anymore. Instead, it just went to stocks and, you know, technology because technology was having this huge boom. And, you know, now they, they cut rates again after COVID to zero and like it's not going to necessarily go into subprime or, or tech. It's going to go into something. And that's something when it when it pops, you know, it's difficult to predict beforehand where, where it's going to show up. But I am worried that there's some sort of like, you know, financial wobble or volatility that's coming that we don't see. It's difficult to predict where it is, but you know, maybe it's just the actual bond market itself. Who knows? I don't want to sound like the eternal conspiracy theorist perma bear, but I mean, if the shoe fits, I'll wear it. I don't know if you guys have seen on X, there was a post that was circulating around probably about two or three weeks ago that was showing the job market. If you look at the difference in employment statistics between, I think, 2020 or, or maybe 2019 and today, at least in the United States, the job statistics for for native born workers versus foreign born workers is so incredibly lopsided. There has been a negative growth of native born employment statistics from 2019 till today is actually down roughly 300,000 and foreign born employment numbers is up by like 4 million. So they're pushing the real statistic away and just and saying like whether these are temporary or permanent residents or whatever, we've essentially replaced part of the actual jobs with this other thing. And we're going to try and pass this off as a soft landing. Leads me to believe with a lot of other things that everything in finance is fake. That might explain partly why the Teamsters Union is not so pro-Harris as they previously have been. It's like almost 60% of the Teamsters are favoring Trump, which is like very atypical for a union like that. That is kind of an interesting, kind of an interesting dynamic for sure. Yeah, it's funny. We were just, I was having a call with Bill earlier and describing the Democratic Party as sort of the new ne neocon party where everyone is uniting, everyone pro-war and sort of like anti-free speech is getting together on that side of the aisle, which is funny because the name of the party obviously no longer fits. One thing I want to say is that like actually rate cuts and trying to predict macro is in like the next six to eight weeks is not really going to matter all that much. All that really matters is the election, right? I mean, as it stands yeah. now, we know one party is super pro crypto and one is not. And that's really what's going to yeah. move markets. Yeah. And just to sort of bridge the gap between uh, Jared being sort of our perma bear conspiracy theorist and just everyone else, I am starting to sort of like 
there are too many coincidences, right? Like, so this rate cut happening a month and a half before the election and no rate cuts for four years. I don't know. I'm not on a conspiracy side of things usually, but like, that's a weird coincidence amongst many other coincidences that we've seen recently. One day after the rate cut, S&P made new highs. We're in the best economy the world has ever seen. Yeah, basically. <laughs> so one thing that I do think is positive, because I've had this like, like wonder if we start you know, cutting rates, we end up with uh, inflation bounce back. And then if, if we get a recession at the same time, that's like particularly problematic. From what I can tell, you know, energy, which is the most important component to inflation, I think probably, oil prices seem to be trending down. I've heard different theories on why that would be, like maybe it's because China's economy is struggling. I've also heard that it's it's partly like a, a rebalancing where, you know, I think, again, China is converting a bunch of diesel, diesel semi trucks to natural gas because there's a there's a price differential between those two energy sources. But either way, that has kind of. I, I think is somewhat of a positive indicator that, that hopefully, at least, we don't get a huge inflation bounce back. Okay, maybe we can move to the next topic. We wanted to tackle Sky, which is, so sorry, USDS, which is going live this week. Um, Reth, do you have any comments on that topic? Is that something you want to talk about this? Yeah, so MakerDAO is kind of the oldest um, and one of the most important DeFi protocols ever. It, it uh, pioneered what's called a CDP, a collateralized debt protocol. It's a way of creating a stable coin. MakerDAO for a few years now has had this vision they call the end game that is a series of upgrades to kind of take it to the next level. As part of that, MakerDAO rebranded to Sky and they have a new stable coin called USDS. USDS is very similar to DAI. In fact, you can convert your DAI to USDS and vice versa. And then they have a new Gov token called Sky um, and you can convert your MKR to Sky and, and there's a number, number of other changes. I think the big things to note, there's a little bit of pushback on USDS because it's censorable, kind of like USDC, whereas DAI was not. The counter argument there is that DAI was always, or for the last several years, has been indirectly censorable anyway, because like half of DAI or more it has typically been basically wrapped to USDC. So Circle could censor the USDC that MakerDAO is holding and it would effectively censor DAI. So being able to censor it directly, my guess is this is, you know, helping them to be able to comply with some regulatory hurdles that could help um, with adoption. So that's one big difference with USDS. The DAI savings rate, where if you take your DAI, convert it to SDAI, you just get, you know, you get paid yield, is now called the Sky Savings Rate, the SSR. They are paying that out. So if you just hold and stake your USDS, you'll around a 7% yield right now, which is pretty solid. And the other big thing they're doing with, you know, two, two other big things they're doing, which I think are, are really cool. One is they're going to start a, a major like adoption incentives program. So the Sky token. Some of it's mintable from MKR and the rest of it they'll be using to incentivize adoption throughout the ecosystem. So I think that could drive a lot of growth to MakerDAO, which could be great and could be great for other products too, who want to, you know, pair to USDS and benefit from those incentives. And then the other big thing is um, ecosystem related projects. The most prominent is Spark. It's a lending protocol that was built that's kind of like in the MakerDAO family. Spark and others, they're turning them into, they call them stars, but the, the, but another term is a, a sub DAO. So these will have their own DAOs with their own tokens, their own kind of goals. And the idea behind this from Rune is that if all of it is captured under the same umbrella, DAO umbrella, then you can end up with a lot of like governance friction. And one of Maker's biggest challenges has been governance friction. And so uh, Rune's hope is that he can save the concept of a DAO by splitting MakerDAO into these sub DAOs that can each kind of sink or swim on its own and, and kind of govern within its more narrow scope. So that's kind of an overview. There's some other elements of Endgame that will be rolled out later. They have talked about rolling out a MakerDAO chain. Maybe it'll be an L2, maybe it'll be an L1. That's not here yet, but there's some of these other things coming in the future. 
Gotcha. Red, forgive my ignorance, but if so, I haven't kept up to date with it. If you hold the maker token, you can go convert it for Sky, you're saying, but then like, are you able to participate in the new sub debt? Like, are there going to be multiple coins that you're able to exchange for, or you can just take maker, maker and change it to the new Sky coin? Maker just directly converts to Sky right now. One, one MKR is 24,000 Sky. And I can't remember, but it might be that if you convert your MKR to Sky, then you'll end up with sub DAO like airdrops. But I'm not sure. I need to check on that again. But these other tokens will have, these other sub DAOs will have their own tokens. Distribution mechanisms of those tokens may differ. I would need to review again. But my guess is holding Sky is going to get you benefits throughout the ecosystem. Is the original system going to continue running? if people want to continue using that, or are they trying to actively migrate everything over? Yeah, you can hold your MKR and you can hold your die and you'll never be forced to convert. Yeah, if you, if you want to hold the old stuff. There even was an older version of die that they call Psy, S-I-E, but it's been basically dead for a long time. That was when, when MakerDAO first launched, it was single collateral ETH. And when they upgraded to be multi-collateral, that's when, when, when die was formed. I wonder if the people who are rejecting this move will try to do something in the future with Die and Maker, if they can potentially, I don't know, take that back over or something. Do you see something like that even being possible or no? My view is that those, so, so there has been kind of a divergence of vision with MakerDAO. The early days of MakerDAO, there were a number of supporters who were a big fan of the idea that it's highly censorship resistant and highly decentralized, meaning, you know, the collateral is things like ETH, um, Bitcoin, etc. In 2020, MakerDAO had a big problem during the, the crash of uh, March 2020. DAI went way over peg. There was a lot of problems in liquidations and debt repayments, etc. And that's when they introduced their peg stability module which allowed you to mint die from USDC. That introduced a lot of stability to the system, which brings great benefits. But there's this other group of people who were, felt like it moved MakerDAO away from the, the vision that captivated them, which was the more like decentralized version. I think the people of that second group that, that don't like the fact that USDS is censorable, that it has USDC in it, et cetera, I think they're just supporting other projects now instead. So Liquidity is a big one. Liquidity is coming out with Liquidity V2. Gravitas also, you know, all um, censor censorship resistant collateral, et cetera. And there's a few others. Reflexor, which also has some other interesting properties. It's not it's not a pegged stable coin. It's a floating, um, floating stable coin. So anyway, the point is, I think the people who don't like this kind of move toward more censorship or mostly just supporting other stable coins instead. Just a side note, I do think it's pretty optimistic to see the number of these protocols that are popping up and just making a go at it. Right. Just cause you mentioned it. Um, so it seems like the sky upgrade is basically, you know, trying to make governance a bit more manageable, you know, integrating a lot more into other DeFi platforms doing, I mean, it's kind of silly, but they're the 24,000 to one thing also changes the unit bias a bit, right? It's kind of hard to buy maker when it's like, whatever it is, like 1500 or whatever it is. Um, like Liquidity V2, just because you mentioned it, what, what's the big upgrade there? What's the, what's the change from the original version? So there's a few big changes. One is instead of single collateral ETH, it's multi-collateral. Two will be immutable, but it'll have like five-ish collateral types. They'll all be, it'll be ETH plus a, a small number of ETH liquid staking tokens. So that's change number one. Number two is you have this concept of user set interest rates. So each borrower can come in and choose what their own interest rate is. If you're paying the highest interest rate, you would be the last person redeemed. You know, so in a DPEG event, borrowers can have their debt force repaid and you'd be the last one in that list. So that's that's the kind of the most innovative element. So it's kind of like a wisdom of the crowd's interest rate. And the whole system's immutable. It does not introduce a new Gov token. It leverages LQTY a little bit or quite a bit. But uh, yeah, so so that's a system that people who want a highly decentralized, highly immutable censorship resistant stablecoin are more likely to support. The trade-off is it's almost certainly going to be less scalable. So you kind of have this stablecoin trilemma. And so MakerDAO is likely to be more scalable. 
Liquid V2 is going to be a little bit more niche, but still relatively scalable. You have just different people that that will serve. Kind of bullish on the fact that um, Liquid is going for crypto only as collateral. There's going to be some interesting game theory with the rates on the bars. That'll be fun. Fun to watch. Could end up being a really interesting, just the liquidity, like aggregate interest rate could be an interesting, like decentralized, like market rate Oracle or something. It will be fun to um, watch how everything evolves. Um, I thought we could touch on BTC this week. Yeah, Um, brought to the forefront a little bit by Trump using Bitcoin for the first time. Did you guys see that? But it was kind of funny, though, because it was painful to watch, dude. They're like, did the transaction go through or not? Did it? Yes. Everyone's like, should we cheer or not? Trump's like, this is incredible. Like, it it was just... Oh man, so awkward to watch, so fun. But yeah, definitely like that touches on this like Bitcoin is money topic. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. So just, just to sort of intro the, the question at hand, I, I think there's two topics that affect the way I think of, uh, of BTC and should it be money. So the first one is that there's sort of a security crisis that is moving towards BTC with every halving that happens every four years, the security budget, if the price of BTC is stable, gets cut in half. So there's an implicit assumption that if the security budget is going to stay the same, that means that BTC price has to double every four years. So there's an exponential relationship between the potentially decreasing security in the future and BTC, which is a very slow moving, but very, I think, serious crisis that could that could occur. Um, Obviously, you could solve that by not having uh, BTC have a determined number of of tokens. You You could, in other words, have inflation, which then would sort of uh, destroy one of the major thesis or, or interest points in BTC. So that, that would be a sort of a different crisis, but I guess it could be fixed in that way. Uh, the the second, I think, issue with BTC as money is that as the Trump example shows, it is just a very clunky way to transact. It is, in my opinion, and I say this with affection, a bit of a dinosaur chain. It is the first version of crypto and as anything that is V1, you know, eventually there is something just much better in, from, in, in terms of technology that we can use to do whatever it is that we're trying to do on that technology. That being said, what's money? Is money technology or is it a belief in a certain item? So US dollars are made of paper, not technologically advanced, but it works. People believe in it. So yeah, I'm not sure at which point this becomes more of a philosophy chat or sociology ta- chat, but yeah, I'll just throw this topic open to the to the panel, whoever wants to comment on first. Curious what you guys think at this point in time. I'll be quick. I mean, anything that's value fluctuates as much as Bitcoin or Ethereum, I just have a hard time calling it money. At least, you know, look, we were very lucky, at least, you know, I, I live in the States, the dollar is relatively stable, like it's hard to call it money. But I will say there's some interesting stuff happening with Bitcoin, which there's a Nakamoto upgrade for stacks, which is basically going to make Bitcoin a lot more active and could be kind of an interesting area to watch if they want to try to you know turn Bitcoin into some sort of a synthetic dollar the way Athena did. You know, maybe something arises out of there, but Bitcoin itself as money is just so volatile. I just have a hard time calling it money. Same thing with ETH. Yeah, it would be hard to try and write some kind of a financial contract in Bitcoin and then you know, someone's on the hook for an asset that has either gone up by, you know, 20 or 30% or has gone down by 50% at any given time by the end of that contract. It's definitely not money per se. I don't think it's a very good unit of trading back and forth between financial actors. But I mean, I guess there is the kind of want to call it like a boomer take these days that Bitcoin is like digital gold. I'm not sure I believe it. It's actually one of the reasons why this is top of mind. I, I had dinner with some older bankers or some one specifically older banker uh, last week, um, but very high level. And I think Bitcoin is sort of seen and accepted amongst like sort of like forward thinking baby boomers as maybe the next form of money. And this is funny because I just don't know anyone in, in our circles. Like any, anyone who's heavy in DeFi doesn't usually really care about BTC that much, except that it moves the market. But no one is thinking about it as like this sort of innovative form of anything, right? So yeah, just the contrast there is interesting. Well, if I had a conversation with those people, I would welcome them to 2011. 
because Bitcoin is exciting internet money. It's the money of the future. So I share some of the concerns about the ongoing security budget. I think I'm slightly less concerned than I used to be because there is some building happening on top of Bitcoin, which is driving more transaction fees. But the amount of additional transaction fees you would need to drive is, is enormous. The easiest ways to solve it would be to have tail emissions, which breaks the 21 million promise, um, or um, switch to proof of stake, which uh, reduces the amount of revenue you need to stay secure. That seems like almost certainly not going to happen as well. I think the other thing that could happen, so the Bitcoin L2s, most of them are something like a proof of stake network where you're staking Bitcoin and and then you're posting some uh, data to Bitcoin and you're doing some other things to be uh, really aligned. That drives demand for Bitcoin, which is good. Um, what would probably be like maybe more sustainable for Bitcoin is if some L2 started launching that were instead maybe like merge mined, where you run a Bitcoin miner and you can simultaneously val validate this L2 and you get your payments from the Bitcoin blockchain and from this L2. And if that L2 drives a lot of fees and revenue, et cetera, then it could, it could help your miners stay profitable. Um, that sort of thing, merge mining has existed for a little while, but you'd need highly profitable merge mining, something where you have an Ethereum level of economic activity to keep those miners profitable. So there's something like that that could happen to solve the security budget, I think. Very unlikely to happen. The, I, I remember when merge mining came around and there was this whole idea that you could mine two things at the same time. The only like coins or tokens that ever attempted to do this were like very short lived and not really great projects as far as I'm, I was aware. Yeah, for sure. So for merge mining to be sustainable, it needs to be, you need to meet merge mining something with a lot of economic activity, right? So like if something like Ethereum level was being merge mined, but yeah, I, I agree with you. Most of what's happened there in the past is you're merge mining some uh, chain that's dying pretty quickly. And so it's a fleeting boost. Um, as far as it being money, I think the volatility Volatility uh, should shrink over time, especially if it continues to grow. So I think things can kind of like become more money-like over time. So a little bit less um, concerned about that. I think my, my biggest thing is that I think all forms of money start with like strong utility and then they start accrue this monetary premium. And Bitcoin does not have as much utility as I would like to see. It's not none, but it's definitely less than some of the other crypto assets, Ethereum being like the kind of the poster child of, you know, highly, you know, very high utility. Gold, I think, has utility and a monetary premium. Dollars have utility. The main form of utility for dollars is U.S. economy is the biggest in the world and you have to pay taxes in dollars. So it's kind of your cost of entry into the world's biggest economy. Um, I think similarly, if Bitcoin is going to become more money-like over time, its utility needs to grow as well. I think that's the opposite view most Bitcoiners have. They say, oh, a good money should have very little utility, but I disagree. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think being built on top of an economic system is really what determines what makes um, strong money, at least in like the sort of current system that we have. Um, I sort of think of money as unspent um labor credit. So like people, it's obviously like it's a ledger where you know, there is an exchange of really labor because at, at the end of the day, everything we have in the economy is mostly labor. So like even hard goods, like a computer or, you know, a, a piece of metal needed to be taken out of the ground, to take it out of the ground, you have to build a, a, a machine and to build a machine, you have to build another machine. But what it really comes down to at the end of the day is really just labor, right? It took hours to build each step of that production. There's a little bit of what the economy is that is just the, um, the sort of capital resources that we have on the planet. Like there's a limit there. So I, I think there's some sort of like, if something is rare, that, that is that has some work. But otherwise, like all of our economy is labor and dollars are unspent labor credits and you know, if you look at the value, the underlying value of a dollar, it's made of paper and it's worthless, right? So like, let's say it's worth a penny, um, but it says $1. So you have 99 cents of, of extra extra wealth built on top of it. So money is just an idea that we all agree on, but to build that idea and to get everyone to buy into it, if it can be conveniently placed at the middle of your life, number one, and then number two, yeah, just to get the idea to be converged on by everyone in society, if you can build an economy around that idea, 
I think that's probably the easiest way to create money. I don't see that happening on Bitcoin, so I agree with Rev. I do see that happening a little bit on Ethereum. So sort of like the beginning throws of like what could be a real economy. But that, that's sort of my mental model to sort of bring all this together. I don't know if that is too sort of theoretical that, or... No, that that's great. And like, look, in, in crypto, we're really searching for a decentralized money, right? Something like, okay, it, it's going to be Bitcoin or Ethereum or maybe some sort of a stable coin. You know, we like a decentralized economy needs a decentralized stable coin. You see this all the time, right? Like you hear this all the time. Like if, we ever, if we're going to have a decentralized economy, we need a decentralized stable coin. They can't be seized by someone, right? But I, Jeff, I kind of like what you're saying, because basically what you're kind of saying is that actually a decentralized stable coin maybe needs a decentralized economy. Like there actually needs to be like work happening in this new decentralized economy that we have that is somehow being paid with crypto not in the United States necessarily, not necessarily within the borders of a country, but within this ecosystem of people who are participating in crypto, there has to be some work happening that needs to get paid. And yeah, like I, I don't think any of the forms of, you know, money or stable coins that we see in crypto right now are it. Like it's not Bitcoin or ETH. It's not fiat backed stable coins. It's definitely not algo stable coins. You know, maybe these kind of market neutral stable coins similar to Athena, maybe that's onto something, but you can kind of argue that that stuff still relies on the traditional banking system. So in my opinion, like whatever is going to be money is actually not here yet. It, it's going to require some sort of a leap or invention or something. Yeah, it's not here yet. Just on that comment, I, I, I would sort of think about every stable coin as I don't really care if it's in crypto. To me, that's still a U.S. dollar. It's replicating the U.S. dollar. It's following exactly. the U.S. economy. It's, it's built exactly. on top of the U.S. economy. So if you want a BTC economy where you or a BTC dollar and you don't want it to fluctuate versus other economies like let's say the US economy, you need to build a real economy on top of Bitcoin. Right now it's all speculation, which is why people are trading in and out. There's no real utility for it. There's no companies that have to hold it day to day and pay their employees or employees are holding it day to day. So there's no stability because there's no usage. It's just pure speculative value and it's just being thrown around. So that's where I guess like Ethereum has a little bit more value because there there is some real you know there are some real things happening on ethereum but in terms of like running a real economy i, I wouldn't say we're we're really close to that yet there either yeah there's some maturity needed one comment i think a lot of people these days are used to having one dominant global currency because of the dollar and bitcoiners especially think okay it'll just be bitcoin that dominates the whole world i think the world's probably better off if there's many competing currencies with you know, some level of adoption each. I think a number of the L1s could, you know, fulfill that in greater and lesser degrees. In stable coins themselves, there are a few other non-dollar experiments that haven't got a ton of traction yet, but I think could be interesting. So Rai is one where this model, it still references the dollar, but it's not pegged. And then there's others that don't even reference the dollar. So like one of the tokens that like F of X has put out, you have two tokens, you know, you deposit ETH, and then you can choose to either have volatility amplified ETH or volatility dampened ETH. The volatility dampened ETH does like, it's like 10% of the price movement of ETH up and down. So it's referencing ETH, but it has, you know, less price fluctuation. I could see products like that potentially having some attraction where you have people who are mostly denominating in ETH, Bitcoin, AVAX, Solana, et cetera. And, and then if you want some of it in something that's a little bit more stable, you convert it into this vol dampened version. But I personally think a lot of it's just a function of adoption. Like the system needs to get multiple orders of magnitude larger, more adopted. Um, uh, and those things will re lead to some more stability and liquidity. And then those things can create an opportunity to actually supplant government currencies. I'm going to have a take that's a complete departure from my normal kind of takes. So one of the questions I would have is how far away or how close are we to a point where people actually stop holding the dollar and therefore also stop holding stable coins because it, it also becomes too volatile or just starts losing too much value to, you know, constant inflation, which kind of brings me to, Another idea of what would be in crypto currently the most held tokens that have the widest user base that could easily be adopted as money. I think I don't think Bitcoin is a good option for that because everyone who holds it just doesn't plan to do anything with it. 
I think Ethereum could be a good candidate, but maybe a crazy idea would be meme coins because a lot of people hold a lot of meme coins. That's the Elon Musk view is that it could be Dogecoin and that the universe may choose the most entertaining outcome, which could be interesting. It would go against my utility argument. But as far as like how soon we could see the dollar becoming this thing that nobody wants to hold and everyone wants to, you know, denominate in and uh, trade in some non-government currency or something, even optimistically, I think we're several decades away from that, like three, four five decades. Optim like That would be like the most optimistic scenario. Like I think the size of it and the momentum and the gravity is so large that you need the size of crypto to, you know, multiply many times over both in just market cap and also in distribution before you could even begin to do things like trade oil in, in Bitcoin or ETH or whatever it is. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely far away, but then again, it's only one or two good catastrophes away from, you know, people losing faith in the system. So Rhett, uh, dog money goes against your utility argument, but sounds like you're here for it. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to be wrong. I'm wrong. All, I'm wrong often, but also, you know, it's possible that it could create, you know, utility could be built on it. You know, like if, if Dogecoin, so Dogecoin is one of the few meme coins that is its own blockchain. If they, you know, upgraded the blockchain to have greater utility and it got, you know, you know, some utility was built into it, then that would, that would help drive the, the adoption and the moneyness, I think. I'm definitely more of a dog person. So happy to be on your side here. Maybe this is a good good point to wrap it up. I, I feel like this is going to be an ongoing conversation throughout different pods and we should probably do um, a Bitcoin L2 pod at some point uh, with a guest. I think that would be nice. So if anyone in the audience knows anyone we should envy there, please give us some names, intro us, or we will be burdened on finding that person ourselves. But yeah, I think that'd be a fun episode. Cool. If anyone has any departing thoughts. Um, no. I think I've made this case over a year ago that Bitcoin L2s or Lightning Network or even just Bitcoin tokens, the more that they gain traction, the more they will end up killing Bitcoin because like, so Bitcoin requires the security budget in, in order to continue running. It requires that it increase in value in order to continue that security budget. But if you have a system where People are just constantly taking these tokens away and putting them on other chains and then reducing the fees that the actual Bitcoin miners are generating from the activity on the chain. Then you can have a bunch of Bitcoin activity over here, but then the actual chain itself is just going to wither away and die. Yeah, I guess I guess we could end on, on this point. If you're building a Bitcoin L2, come on the pod and debate, Jared. I look forward to it. You've got some good candidates for that. Amazing. On that note, let's wrap it up here. Thanks everyone for watching and see you next week. Thanks so much, guys. Bye. It's fun. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye-bye.